<lacht> so, ja, vielen Dank, dass äh, ähm, ihr immer noch hier seid. <lacht> äh, ich hatte mich eigentlich darauf eingerichtet, das auf Englisch zu machen, da ich auch ein paar anderen Leuten im Ausland Bescheid gesagt habe. Gibt es da irgendwelche äh, vehementen Widersprüche? Wir hatten ja gerade auf Englisch. Um, okay, so if, if this is all right with everyone, then uh, I'd go ahead and do this in English, um, because there are actually some friends of mine uh, watching, I hope, um, abroad uh, in, in Israel and uh, the US, and therefore, yeah, um, as a courtesy to them, uh, I do this in English so they can follow. Um, to give you a little bit of background uh, on this uh, myself. I mean, as kindly introduced, one thing that I should add is that I also attended the European College of Liberal Arts. I was, uh, last time I did a lecture, there are some folks from, from ECLA there, and they're disappointed that you know, ECLA wasn't mentioned. So uh, as part of my bio, the European College of Liberal Arts was recently taken over by BART uh, up in, north, in the north of Berlin. Um, if you don't know, it's, it's a great place. Uh, I went there for a year, another sort of, um, uh, yeah, sort of line of, of, of the CV that um, went missing. And uh, so, that's, um, so that's my biography. Then there is another person that unfortunately cannot be here. Unfortunately, Yehuda passed away two months ago. Um, we wrote this book together, um, as Kristen mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, it was really um, a collaborative work in, in many ways and a very interesting collaboration at that because uh, he was 50 years my elder, as you can see. And uh, this is sort of one of my favorite photos of his and, and, and he really liked that as well. And it really showed uh, that it shows that he was a, he's a very relaxed person. And that also, is, I think there's a nice anecdote that I'd like to tell you that, that sort of illustrates that the way we got to know each other. And that was that I was at a lecture uh, at Humboldt University. Um, and after the lecture, there was a little reception and, you know, stood there with my glass of champagne and sort of, you know, all these honorary, uh, honorable um, figures, you know, in the room and I was a little lost between them. Uh, and then suddenly he walked up to me and looked at me and was like, you're the only person here that doesn't have gray hair and you asked an intelligent question. Let's have lunch, you know? <laughs> so that, that is really, uh, as I said, that's the kind of person uh, he was and it was, it was a tremendous opportunity to work with him. He wasn't only a very uh, distinguished colleague but also a, a friend and a mentor uh, for me um, in many ways. And um, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's sad that he can't be here but uh, I, I wanted to sort of commemorate him by giving you a little introduction um, to, uh, to him um, in this context. Uh, that he did actually sort of pass on many things to me that I learned a lot from him, actually became very vividly illustrated when recently there was a photographer at our diversity office taking pictures of the team and you know, taking pictures of us in the office. And then when I looked through the pictures, there was one that you know, made me think, okay, <laughs> clearly there's an influence uh, here uh, to be seen. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, it's a random picture that wasn't staged, I, I shall add. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a clear influence. So what is this book about, uh, you may wonder? Actually, this, by the way, is what it looks like. This is the book. Um, the book is called the Universität im 21. Jahrhundert, the University in the 21st Century, and it is really about rethinking the university for the 21st century uh, in two aspects. One is uh, the idea that we should rethink the Enlightenment, should rethink uh, university curricula. What is it that universities teach content-wise? Uh, with what objective? And then we should also rethink our teaching practices. How is it that we teach? Now, I'll have to sort of backtrack a little bit, and uh, I'll jump to the next slide for that. Um, when, when we talk about rethinking the Enlightenment, not unthinking, that is, rethinking the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment was very necessary in, in many ways, but also uh, we, we've sort of arrived at a, at a dead end, if you will. The, uh, the idea here is that uh, Yehuda argued um, you know, uh, that the last few decades, um, of uh, in the, uh, different, you know, I mean, different um, scholars working in philosophy of science, history of science, uh, sociology of science, they um, uncovered that in many ways we, um, the, the kind of enlightenment thinking got us to a point we, where there's a lot of 
uh, great advances in many disciplines, across many disciplines, um, that were spawned by Enlightenment thinking, but uh, now that kind of um, ebbed off. And uh, increasingly, we're meeting problems that we cannot solve uh, in, in the way we were thinking about things before. It's really about what kind of understanding of knowledge do we have? What kind of understanding of knowledge do we, do we teach? The, uh, Yehuda made this distinction between the images of knowledge and the body of knowledge. And um, the Enlightenment values uh, that are, some of them are listed here, and it's just sort of a um, somewhat eclectic collection, but it gives you an idea, um, are reductionism, secularism, universalism, rationalism, linearity, coherence, reducibility, predictability, measurability, context independence, and abhorrence of contradictions, and anti-dialectical th dialectical thinking. So that would mean, for example, that in the context of uh, you know, modeling something, uh, in the context of many theories, um, you know, scholars uh, practice some sort of reductionism to keep things uh, simple. Um, but there's a famous saying that you should make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Oftentimes, we do make it simpler, um, and it doesn't actually really account for, for what reality uh, really is like. The, the Enlightenment was also a reaction to the wars of religion, um, in, in, in Britain in particular, um, and it was, it was a secular movement, um, and it's sought to prove that there's such thing as universal knowledge. There's, uh, there's something, we, we can know the one truth uh, was very important because previously everyone sort of said, I believe this, and someone else said, I believe that, and there's a lot of factionism and a lot of conflict and strife that resulted from these different beliefs. And here uh, was this new idea that there's this one truth out there and we just have to find it using the scientific method. Um, so there are good reasons for why these kind of values shape our understanding of science and knowledge. But as, uh, as I said, we now have to move on because we increasingly face situations where um, this, this kind of approach doesn't yield the right kind of results. And then there are the new enlightenment values that, uh, that are in many ways the opposite of what I just mentioned. It's about contextualizing knowledge. It's about reasonability rather than rationality, nonlinearity rather than linearity, dialectical thinking, thinking about things in context, being aware of the fact that you know, theories might be incoherent. Issues oftentimes are very complex. You need different perspectives. The world is messy, messy and complex, and uh, we might have to embrace these contradictions um, and live with them. And, um, and it's this kind of thinking that, in our opinion, undergraduate education should foster. So I mentioned there's this distinction between the body of knowledge and the images of knowledge. And this is not about relativism. So this is not about, you know, everything goes, you know, everyone thinks, has their own theory about whatever it may be, and, and you know, it's all equally valid or not. That's not the case. The physics of nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear physics, for example, it's the same in Japan as it is here or in the US or in France. That's the body of knowledge. How we understand nuclear physics on, for example, the uh, danger of you know, making use of nuclear uh, technology is very, very different in all these countries that I just mentioned. So clearly, you know, the, the, while there is this one reality that we all, all live in and it has certain laws, our understanding of that reality, understanding of these laws and, and, and what they may mean in the context of our society is very, very different. And it's this kind of thinking that we have to, um, that we have to teach at the university level. And in our opinion, we should teach that early on. This is not something that should be uh, you know, revealed to PhD students where they say, well, you know, you learned all these undergraduates uh, theories in your bachelor's degree. Um, Actually, it's not the case, you know. Uh, actually, you know, the world is complex and messy and we don't, oftentimes, really don't know and uh, there are different theories and different perspectives and, you know, uh, there, there are all these different um, ways of uh, seeing the world and, and accounting with it. Clearly, this is the case 
in some disciplines. I mean, uh, some of you might think, you know, well, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm in, in the humanities. This is what we do. You know, it's all about multiple perspectivity, and we're, this is what we do all day. Sure, but it's not true for all disciplines. So not everything I say is true for everything, and I'm sure you'll be able to come up with plenty of examples where you say, oh, yeah, but there is this one institution, there's this one professor, and he already does that. I, I grant it, but, you know, by and large, if you look at university instruction, in many of the large uh, disciplines, law, economics, uh, business studies, um, uh, vast areas of the social sciences that kind of mimic the, the hard sciences, the so-called hard sciences, as well as, you know, all the um, STEM subjects, oftentimes it's very much sort of this enlightenment fundamentalist approach to knowledge that's being taught. So what we argue that is that um, in parallel to teaching disciplines, and this teaching disciplines is very important because it, it, it teaches you to think rigorously about an issue, to apply the scientific method, but in parallel to teaching disciplines, there should be interdisciplinary seminars where students from all sorts of areas, uh, all sorts of different disciplines come together and think about um, real world problems together. Real world problems could be drawn from uh, you know, the, the great challenges of humanity, the kind of problems that we try to tackle with, human, uh, with the Millennium Development Goals, because these, de these problems, contagious disease, climate change, water, uh, desertification, and so on, they are by de definition vast and complex. It's nothing that you can solve with any one discipline. You, you, know, you, you won't solve the problem of poverty uh, you know, by just you know, putting a lot of eco economists in one room. You probably need the perspectives of sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, and so on and so on. So, and then it's also not about students solving these problems, obviously. It's about them discussing these problems, understanding the need for other people's perspectives. It's what we call interdisciplinary dialogfähigkeit, you know, enabling them for interdisciplinary dialogue, really letting them see the limitations of their own discipline uh, where, um, where you know, the, the basic theory that is reductionist, rational, you know, and all universally uh, um, applicable, coherent, and so on and so on, all these things that I mentioned as sort of enlightenment value, where that theory breaks down. I mean, it, it, to take a very simple example, sort of the discipline that I know um, best, I guess, this is, which makes it easier for me to draw examples from it, um, would be to, to look at the kind of economics that we teach undergraduates and then look at the financial crisis. It's uh, rien à voir, as they say in French. It, it, you know, it has little to do with each other and, and really making people aware that, yes, there is this theory and it does account for some things, but there's a lot that it doesn't account for and you have to be aware of that. So a lot of you might really wonder, <laughs> um, why is he talking about all of this? By the way, uh, yeah, this is sort of, uh, to sum this up, I actually, I forgot about that. Uh, this is not about intellectual confusion, but about intellectual profusion. So it's not about, uh, you know, well, as I said, relativism, but really about uh, a different kind of broad approach that, you know, lets you see things from uh, very many ways. So, as I said, uh, you, you might be wondering, what does all of this have to do with technology? Why, you know, why, why are we talking about this? Well, for, um, as I said, this um, book is sort of the result of a collaborative effort. So. Yehuda is a philosopher of science, as I mentioned, and uh, he's been working on this for many, many years. So he told, when I met him, he told me, okay, well, this is sort of what I'm working on. This is what I, I feel is really very important uh, when it comes to undergraduate education. And I thought, okay, this sounds great. I, I mean, I, I totally agree with the general approach because that's something that I uh, experienced when I was a student. But what I feel is missing from the equation is the whole issue of technology and how it can really help to make this happen. And this is what I want to talk about um, for the rest of my time up here. And that is, yeah, the, the, how I feel that these two ideas, that we have to reform what it is that we teach, it really is linked to how it is that we should be teaching. Uh, because the, the new forms of teaching that technology enable, in my opinion, are really um, lend themselves very well to teach this kind of understanding of knowledge that I just outlined. So, um, for those of you 
um, who, who've heard all these ideas thrown around. I'm just going to uh, mention a few more, few of the things that you know we've been we've been hearing about earlier, and try to sort of um, put them into some sort of structure of what I see, sort of where we are moving uh, and, and, and um, technology-wise, and then I'll try to draw some conclusions from that. So um, we've all um, talked about. Uh, open educational resources. So there's sort of these first generation digital learning materials. Essentially it was about digitizing what was already there. So people were giving lectures, we're filming them. You know, people were writing documents, we're putting them online. Now there's a second generation uh, of digital learning materials, I think, that is sort of thinking differently about sort of what can the medium do, uh, what, what, how can we use it, um, new kinds of ebooks that have social functionality, um, you know, Khan Academy really rethinking the use of video, not a talking head, but, you know, um, actually being sort of an, a video tutor. I mean, you, you know all of, about all of these different examples. And these kind of things taken together facilitate um, what many of you will know as the, the flipped classroom model, this idea that the teaching that used to be... Uh, um, used to be what we did in class should actually be something that can be automated and is something that students um, consume, if you will, at home, whereas the, what used to be the homework, i.e. The, uh, the, what you, the kind of problems that you work on, is what you do collaboratively in interaction with your peers and your, uh, your teacher uh, in school. Um, now, this idea is also uh, gaining a lot of ground in universities these days. And uh, I think I believe I believe that that can be a very powerful tool. Um, as I mentioned, in 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 this the idea would be to contextualize knowledge. This is exactly what this kind of teaching approach allows to happen. You have a certain kind of body of knowledge that you teach um, using digital technology, and then you contextualize it. You can show the limitations of theories um, and so on um, using this kind of flipped classroom approach. Besides these uh, um, digital learning materials being, you know, uh, more engaging and and and, uh, uh, and fun, they also they also have some other in interesting qualities, um, and that's this whole idea of learning analytics and um, adaptive learning that we've also heard about. So um, some of the examples that you may have come, may or may not have come across. Uh, are the Open Learning Initiative by Carnegie Mellon University. This, by the way, is not something you need to read. It's way too small. It's really just sort of an illustration. I'm going to go into it. Don't worry about what it actually says. <laughs> just uh, uh, take it as, as an image uh, rather than a text. So yeah, the, the, the Carnegie Mellon University developed the Open Learning Initiative, uh, which is an open educational resource that's interactive, that, um, that adapts to, to uh, student interaction. Um, by you know um, providing different kinds of uh, material depending on you know whether or not a student uh, responded correctly to multiple choice questions that are uh, interwoven with uh, the content. Um, there similar stuff is being developed by the German Institute for Artificial Intelligence as well as a company called Newton. Uh, I think there's some interesting um, there, there's definitely some inter interesting insights to be gained and this idea that. Uh, we gather all this data from student interaction with digital learning materials, I think is also very powerful um, along the lines of what I suggested earlier, of uh, you know, improving and automating the kind of teaching that refers to the sort of transmission of knowledge um, and then really frees up time for uh, other sort of higher order um, interactions um, with, with knowledge and, and um, yeah, other forms of teaching. And what this enables us for the, uh, to do for the first time, which is also revolutionary, I think, and, and often underappreciated, is this that there's this closed loop of innovation, and this is what is depicted here. It's actually this is drawn from a paper by the Boston Consulting Group that was published last year. We can try out things, we can evaluate, we can improve. So uh, for the first time, teaching becomes sort of an empirics-based activity rather than something where you know we we kind of throw something out there. And then at the end of the year, there's sort of a one-spot evaluation uh, in form of the final exam. And then there is something else that I think uh, we'll see and that, uh, in my opinion, can be very beneficial, and that's bringing consumer tech to education. Um, you know, everyone's on Facebook. Social networking is really 
powerful in many ways and has, has changed how we organize our social lives. I don't see how this, uh, I mean, un universities aren't making use of it and I don't see how c this can continue because uh, clearly this is a tool that facilitates the exchange of information and ideas and knowledge and this is really what universities are about. Um, another thing that does that is Quora or, or these kind of uh, you know, question-answer uh, applications that allow you to build some sort of knowledge base, be it in the context of a course, be it in the context of an institution. I can imagine that these kind of uh, um, applications that are already being used in the context of open courses could be really powerful if, if they were used uh, institution-wide. And then the third one that is sort of somewhat unusual is online dating, in my opinion. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from online dating. If we say that uh, the, the core value that an institution provides nowadays is not providing access to information, but creating meaningful relationships between like-minded people, then I don't see why we wouldn't fill out, when you're a freshman coming into university, why we wouldn't fill out a questionnaire where you say, okay, you know, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I care about, this is what I want to learn, and then the, the, uh, the system sort of draws on all sorts of institutional profiles by faculty and other students and says, well, this is a senior who's writing his bachelor's thesis about the very topic that you're interested in. This is a research project that's going on. Uh, you know, these are five other freshmen um, that are running a student project in this area. So, so really establishing these connections, and we call this sort of a serendipity accelerator. You know, that, that's sort of the term that we use for, for that. And uh, I think um, that that could also really help with, um, you know, putting the right people in touch and moving beyond just the transmission of, uh, of the body of knowledge. Now, there are two... Um, okay, yeah. I can see. Um, there are two uh, big experiments that uh, try to ascertain um, in the context of existing education institutions what can be done using uh, these kind of technologies. They're both using the Carnegie Mellon uh, Open Learning Initiatives tool in the context of existing universities. One was done in 2003 by Carol Twig, the National Center for Academic Transformation. It's actually from 1999 to 2002. This article was published in 2003. Um, the other is very recent, um, it's by the Ithaker Group and um, William Bowen, former uh, president of uh, Princeton University, who um, oversaw this, this um, project and, and they, they both found that in essence, whoops, uh, what we can do is we can, you know, given the amount of resources available, we can deliver better quality or, um, you know, and they also, uh, there's also the potential to, to save uh, substantial amounts of resources um, if we change the mode of delivery um, to a, a blended learning model that makes use of technology. Now, there obviously, uh, th there's a lot of debate whether or not you can save money uh, using these tools, which is why I, I, I put the sign there that I did. But uh, what, I, what I think um, is, is really interesting is this, uh, is, is the fact that you know they they did some very thoroughgoing experiments, and this is real first, very good evidence that um, there, there is there's a, there's a huge potential, and I think um, it's it's a shame that even though these experiments are ten years old, uh, there's so little. Um, so little has happened in the context of existing institutions um, when it comes to really adopting these kind of tools and, and um, trying to leverage their potential. So the question is, what can be done about it and wh what is happening? And in my opinion, something really powerful is happening, and that is this whole movement of open courses that recently began. Now, most of you will have heard about it. I'll give you a quick recap for, for those who, who you know, may not be familiar. In the fall of uh, 2011, there were uh, two teams of academics at Stanford who decided you know, that they didn't want to just teach to the few students who were uh, in the lecture hall at Stanford, but they really wanted to open up their classroom to the world and, and invite everyone in. And they had tremendous success. More than 100,000 students joined each of those two classes. Now, not all of those uh, actually you know, followed the whole thing, and she, she, clearly there were some who were just curious, but more than 23,000 passed uh, the final exam of Professor Troon's class, for example, in artificial intelligence. 
the average time until a stu a student's question was answered was 22 minutes. So there's a lot of interaction, uh, you know, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning going on. Um, the best students in that class, there are more than 200 people who scored a full 100% score on the final exam. None of them was a Stanford student. So there are all these people sitting around the world who really benefited tremendously and learned a lot from, uh, from this course. And uh, then also we, we begin to learn a lot about learning. So there, I think there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of positive developments that come with this. And this really changed the conversation about the use of technology in higher education in the US. Um, there are two startups that famously sort of grew out of these two initial pilot projects, Udacity and Coursera. Harvard and MIT teamed up, and by now I think Berkeley, University of Texas, um, they joined in and uh, formed this consortium called edX. And uh, it's really, there, there, there are 38 universities, I think, or 33, well, uh, that, that have joined course era in the meantime. So there's really um, a rush, sort of a gold rush of online learning. And now a lot of you who've been in this for many, many years will say, okay, you know, um, well, we'll see where this all goes. It's not, it's not really sort of, um, it's, it hasn't sort of penetrated the core of the institutions. It's kind of um, on the. Uh, it's just sort of a marketing um, um, phenomenon, if you will. But I do believe that it really does harrow uh, substantial change. Um, why is it that these were so successful? Some of you may ask also, and that um, I want to quickly talk about that um, before I draw to a close, and that is. Um, the question, so what is an open course and why is it different? I mean, we've been hearing about e-learning for a long time. In my opinion, there are four sort of distinctive elements that make it, uh, that, that have made these courses so successful. One is that they've made uh, use of video in a different way. They didn't just, you know, have a talking head. They didn't just film a 90-minute lecture. They really broke it down to the individual concepts and then explored, explored these concepts in short videos, two minutes, five minutes, um, and they turned the camera 90 degrees, filming their own hands as if they were a tutor. I mean, if you're supposed to explain something uh, to a student, then you, you probably wouldn't give them a lecture. You'd probably sit down next to them, put a sheet of paper on the table, and, and start you know, writing something down. And that is what they did. Um, the, second, the second important uh, aspect of, on how these are different is that um, there was, instruction was interwoven with assessment. So it's not just evaluative assessment at the very end of, uh, of a course, but formative assessment throughout the course. So when you watch the video, there's a short, there are a couple of multiple choice questions. They you know, check whether you actually listened, understood what you, you just heard about, and that really helped people um, sort of stay on, uh, on track and, and, and focus because, yeah, obviously there's also some sort of element of instant gratification, if you will, to, the, to this. Uh, if you, um, you, know, you, you know, okay, I invested five minutes in watching this video and now I can answer a question that, that I couldn't answer before. So that's empowering and, and motivating and, and which is, is probably one of the reasons why so many people stuck with it. A uh, third element is, as I mentioned, the peer-to-peer -peer learning, making use of uh, the kind of technologies uh, that I mentioned earlier, such as Quora, uh, the, the, a similar kind of system that allows people to um, vote, uh, that, to contribute answers to other people's questions, vote on these, uh, these responses, and then also, um, <clears throat> uh, then also uh, you know, see how um, you, know, you, you, you can, <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost it there. Um, what do I want to say? Anyway, <laughs> no, what I wanted to say is that, that these, um, these question and answer forums were uh, very successful, as I mentioned. There's a lot of interaction, and, and this is the kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning that we haven't seen in previous incarnations of e-learning. Um, uh, they use the kind of technology that helped to structure information, the kind of auto-suggest that you know from Google, you know, you type in a certain keyword and then it says, oh, do you mean this? So they already so say, okay, you know, the, the, this might be a question that you might be interested in, this might be an answer that you might be interested in. And the fourth element, uh, it, in my opinion, was the fact that this is an event. It wasn't something that was put online as an open resource for anyone to access at whatever time. It was no. It was like okay, this has a start date, and there's a there's a due date for the first assignment, and there's a due date for a second assignment. This is going to be over in you know uh, eight weeks of time. So this these four elements, I think, really contributed uh, to the success of these open courses, and. Um, 
and I do think that 2012, given these developments, really is going to be seen as a watershed moment where this, uh, this really sort of came to, into its own, where, where e-learning uh, became uh, mainstream, if you will. I mean, this has already happened in the US, and uh, I think this is about to happen in Europe. At Adversity, we're currently working on finding uh, it's a handful of uh, lecturers, university professors who are interested in running open courses and creating open courses and um, p uh, putting them online so as to create a similar kind of um, dynamic and, and uh, you know, gain media attention for this topic so as to highlight what great potential there is um, when it comes to using technology in education. There's this great quote by David Wiley who said, you know, if, if, um, if people just didn't need social interaction, they just went to the uh, uh, library and, and read, then the library would never have evolved into the university. Uh, so don't get me wrong, I do believe in the power of place. I think institutions are, are here to stay. I think they just have a very different role, and that is also the message of the book, that universities will continue to exist they, uh, they, but they, their role is not to, as I said, um, sort of hand out the body of knowledge, uh, but really to contextualize knowledge and um, you know give students uh, multiple perspectives and let them understand that there are different images of knowledge um, that would um, that would enable them to 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 really see. The world from from uh, to have a, have a worldview that allows them to see the the kind of knowledge that we have in uh, in a way that is sort of comprehensive and in light uh, in line with the new enlightenment values that I mentioned earlier. So I want to close with a quotation from the Stanford report that says, "For the first time in centuries, university administrators and intellectuals are seriously questioning the logic of how we teach and learn, and for the first time, we may actually have the technology to shift the education paradigm." So yeah, let's shift the education paradigm. If you're very interested in uh, talking to me about this book, I'm very glad to do so. I'm, I'll stay here. I have a couple of books uh, with me if you're interested in buying one. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the questions. And uh, uh, yeah, thanks so much. Hi, thank you. Um, there was one thing that you had noted here, it was the, um, the cost disease that sort of uh, ran past. And this, I think, is one of the problems that we're seeing in the United States, that the cost of education is spiraling out of control. And in Germany, we're having more of an uh, administrative nightmare. Um, from my feeling, I'm a professor here in Germany, uh, we're, 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 going, we're spiraling down into this uh, accreditation and, and, and stamps and things that you have to be doing in education that's not leaving room for actually being able to try out new models. Do you have suggestions how we can go about doing this in Germany, getting rid of all of the new straitjackets being applied to us every day in Germany? Um, well, when it comes to the straitjackets, it's interesting. I mean, uh, surely there's the whole issue of accreditation and, and all that comes with it, but to a large degree, the way Bologna has been implemented, I mean, was, it was left to the professors to come up with a way to implement it, and the way they implement it is, is the, one, the, the, the one that everyone's complaining about now. So, uh, um, the, the, I mean, th there, there would have been the opportunity to choose eight instead of six semester bachelor's degrees, for example. Um, but yeah, I mean, given, given what we have now, um, I think one interesting model to look at is Leuphana University in Lüneburg because they, they actually do that, that parallel to your disciplinary education, every semester you do have to take one seminar that comes sort of from a different area. It's not quite what we're suggesting. I mean, what we're suggesting really are these seminars that deal with real world situations where students from all different disciplines come together. It's a, it's a different approach, but they definitely showed that, you know, in, in the context of the existing legal situation and so on, uh, it's possible to have these kind of requirements, if you will, um, for, for bachelor students at a German public institution. Um, so it's not entirely impossible, but uh, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of have to be uh, become creative in, in thinking about 
how to do this. Um, and I think it really comes down to a group of professors coming together uh, to think about curricular issues, which is not really being done because the whole notion of a curriculum that, you know, where a degree is more than the sum of its parts is virtually unknown here, and we don't have, you know, the, the, the distribution requirements or the uh, great books programs and these kind of thing, curricular approaches that you have in the U.S. But I think if, yeah, if there were a group of uh, professors coming together dedicated to drawing up some sort of curriculum that fulfills, uh, that, that, that goes in this direction and, and fulfills this kind of purpose of, you know, educating concerned citizens, then uh, I think um, that would be, that would be a start. just like to shortly comment on the question concerning um, the e-learning system and the accreditation um, that is often connected to them. To some extent, that has a legal basis because in Germany, if you do want to use um, copyright protected material for teaching, um, you have a rule saying you're only allowed to do that if you have a fixed group of person to which you make this material available. So that's why all these um, uh, these e-learning systems are based on the idea that you have um, a limited number of people that can be controlled, otherwise you would not be able to allow to, to use uh, these protected materials. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there's the, there's the exception 52A in, in the Urheberrechtsgesetz that allows you to, to open up to a limited amount of people. But still, I mean, even given that limitation, universities could be doing a lot more than they currently are. Uh, and I mean, these learning management systems, by and large, fulfill a sort of a logistical function, if you will. You can upload documents, you can download documents. Um, it's sort of a PDF graveyard, if you will, but uh, the, you don't see the kind of social interaction um, that uh, I think we all agree could be very beneficial if, uh, you know, uh, if it were really... Um, embedded in, 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 in the DNA of our teaching. All right. <laughs> if there are no more questions, then thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I think we'll have a drink. And uh, as I said, if you're interested in uh, having a chat about this, um, I'll be here for a little longer. And otherwise, I think I'll see you next time.